Okay, welcome everyone to our event on the politics of digital humanitarianism. And first of all, I thank Professor Dr. Christine Bergdorf Sandwick and Dr. Dave Rote for joining us today. But before we turn to our distinguished speakers, I would like to introduce you to the broader topic of humanitarian innovation and the guiding questions for today. And I would like to start with a quote from Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. And it's taken from a longer debate between the savage who represents the old world and the world controller, Mustafa Mont. But I don't want comfort. I want God. I want poetry. I want real danger. I want freedom. I want goodness. I want sin. In fact, said Mustafa Mont, you're claiming the right to be unhappy. All right then, said the savage defiantly. I'm claiming the right to be unhappy. Not to mention the right to grow old and ugly and impotent, the right to have syphilis and cancer, the right to have too little to eat, the right to be lousy, the right to live in constant apprehension of what may happen tomorrow, the right to catch typhoid, the right to be tortured by unspeakable pains of every kind. There was a long silence. I claim them all, said the savage at last. Apparently, Mustafa Mond has the better arguments on his side. In the brave new world, scientific and technological progress has eliminated human suffering. However, in my view, Aldous Huxley stimulates our thinking about what is lost in such an ostensibly perfect world and what it means to be human. For today, we envisage to think in a similar way about humanitarian innovation and in particular, the humanitarian use of digital technologies. And the wave of enthusiasm for innovation in the humanitarian world took off with an innovation sphere that the Active Learning Network for Accountability and Performance in Humanitarian Action, ANAP, organized in 2009. And since then, all major humanitarian organizations, dedicated staff to work on innovation processes, tendered innovation grants and established innovation labs, including the UN's OCHA, the UNHCR, the International Committee of the Red Cross, the European Union's DG ECHO, you name it. Moreover, so-called innovation partnerships have flourished that aim to combine the technical expertise of private companies with the practical experience of humanitarian actors. And the first emergency where digital technologies were used on a large scale was the 2010 earthquake in Haiti, in particular in the form of so-called crisis mapping. And the wave of enthusiasm reached its peak with the World Humanitarian Summit in Istanbul in 2016, because innovation was declared one of the four central themes of the summits and thereby recognized as a central principle for international policymaking. Now in principle, innovation ranges from new products over changes in modes of aid delivery until reforms of policies and institutions. However, as Tom Scott Smith has noted, the humanitarian innovation movement is at its heart a techno-utopian vision. Technologies here hold the promise to solve numerous problems that impede efforts to save human lives. Yet technologies are political because they have a genetic capacity. And this idea of non-human agency originates from science and technology studies and means 
agency is not limited to intentional human beings, but extends to anything that does not define a state of affairs by making a difference, to quote Latour. Therefore, technology configures a social setting, in our case, humanitarian relief operations, in a particular way. Thus, apart from their benefits, digital technologies can have unintended and also potentially harmful consequences. So against this background, we would like to discuss today the political and ethical implications of the humanitarian use of digital technology. And we want to envision how does technology change the practice of humanitarian action and the nature of humanitarianism. And I'm delighted that we can draw for this on the expertise of two excellent colleagues, Professor Dr. Christine Bergthora Sandvik and Dr. Dale Forte. And I would like to introduce them. Christine Bergthora Sandvik holds a professorship in the Department of Criminology and the Sociology of Law at the University of Oslo and is research professor in humanitarian studies at the Peace Research Institute Oslo. She's been closely following the developments in the humanitarian sector, including also in particular, the humanitarian innovation movement. And she published extensively on various kinds of humanitarian technologies. Among others, she wrote a book about humanitarian drones and articles in which she problematizes the use of variables in aid and the management of digital identities after death. And I can really recommend to read her really well-founded and acute analysis. And on top of that, she currently pursues a book project that precisely explores how digitization and identification change humanitarian aid. So obviously we could hardly find a person who is better suited to talk about today's topic. Yet I'm equally pleased that Dr. Dave Water joined us and Dave Water is a senior researcher at the Institute for Peace Research and Security Policy at the University of Hamburg. And in his research, he deals with the technologization of security policy, while he mainly focuses on the field of environmental security. He will talk today about the use of satellite-based remote sensing in humanitarian settings. And theoretically, he engages with resilience as a policy paradigm and contributed to the debate on the Anthropocene and complexity thinking. And currently, Delft leads a project on the knowledge politics of security in the Anthropocene. Now, finally, I would like to explain who I mean when I say we. We, that is the Institute for International Law of Peace and Armed Conflict in Bochum in Germany. And our research focuses on actors, structures, and issues that concern the impairment of human well being, be it through violence, natural disasters, or human rights violations, as well as approaches to prevent or mitigate harm. And the we behind the event today is the Institute's research cluster, Humanitarian Governance and Management. And therefore, I would like to thank our cluster members who helped to prepare the event, and in particular, I thank my colleague Maximilian Bertamini, who will take care for, of the technical side of this event. So now I will give the floor to our speakers. And after the input, we will have time for the discussion until about 4.30. And if you want to make a comment and or ask a question, please post either an S or a V in the F and A or Q&A section. And V means that you want to appear with video, S means that you only want to appear with your, with speaking with your voice. And then we will invite you to speak in order. So we will start now with Dale Fortes' input, 
who, who talks about a specific example of using digital technologies. And then um, Christine Bechtera Sandvik will present her argument or her um, questions on how digital technologies transform the humanitarian system. So Delph, please, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Eva, for this uh, kind introduction. I'll just um, go and try to share my screen as, as usual. Uh, just check if that works. And uh, yeah, maybe tell me if you can see the right screen or if you can see my notes, the right one. That's good. Cool. Um, yeah, I um, mean, thanks again for, for the invitation and um, to Maximilian and Eva for the organization of this event. I'm, I'm really pleased to, to be part of this um, discussion and also to, to meet Christine, whose work has been a true inspiration also for the paper that I'm, or sort of the research that I'm gonna present in my talk today. Um, so um, just to give you an idea of uh, sort of the background of, of my talk, um, this is based on a paper that I've written together um, with two colleagues uh, at the University of Hamburg, um, Christiane Fröhlich and Miguel Rodriguez Lopez. Um, so the paper has just been published with International Political Sociology and it's um, open access. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, um, please take a look. And we're dealing in this paper with uh, what we call sort of the, the um, yeah, visual politics of, of, um, of refugee camp governance and the role of digital uh, technologies in it. So um, my co-authors and I have quite diverse backgrounds. So Miguel is a quantitative social scientist who's working with spatial statistics and remote sensing data, um, for example, on, on urbanization and, and forced migration. And Christiane is a conflict researcher uh, working, uh, who has a strong sort of ethnographic background working on forced migration and the Syrian civil war. Um, and I'm coming more from a sort of critical security background working on, amongst other things, uh, remote sensing uh, from a more or less yeah, Foucauldian perspective, maybe, um, as a certain political technology in the form of power, political power. Um, so at some point, I don't know, four years ago or so, we were sitting together and chatting about sort of this increasing application of remote sensing um, technologies, so satellite technologies, drones, and so on in the humanitarian field. So basically the, ho the whole trend that Eva has just outlined and, and sort of chatting about, yeah, the critique of remote sensing methods by people like Mark Duffield, Lisa Parks, and others, uh, which we basically shared. So it's, it's great um, uh, work that, um, that these people do, but then we thought it's also maybe a bit problematic to, to sort of criticize these t technologies, but not without actually sort of working with them. And so we draw on this idea of sort of doing critique from the, within. Um, and we, we sort of realized that we ha actually had a very unique opportunity here because we, Christiana has just uh, completed her field work in two refugee camps for Syrian refugees in Jordan, Zatari and Azraq, which you can see on this slide. Um, and we knew that these two camps are also frequently subjected to sort of satellite surveillance by UNOSAT and other humanitarian actors. Um, so our idea was then to compare sort of the machine vision, the machine gaze that is produced through such, such technologies uh, with sort of the perspective on the ground uh, based on Christiana's fieldwork. And then sort of to work out a kind of critique of, of these remote uh, view uh, from within by sort of reenacting these technologies. And our sort of working assumption was that the view from above produces a certain sense of order um, and, and sort of disorder about these two camps, Zatari and Azraq, which is completely oppositional to the experiences of the people living in these camps. Uh, as uh, became evident in Christiana's fieldwork. So, um, yeah, our aim is to study sort of the political effects of the increasing use of satellite technology and other remote ma methods in the governance of refugee camps. Um, and for this, we ask which forms of seeing 
showing and governing the refugee camp are made possible through the increasing use of remote technologies uh, by humanitarian actors. Um, and in the back, you can already see one of these sort of ways of seeing, ways of seeing the refugee camp. And this loop is, um, video loop is taken out of a video by, provided by UNISAT, uh, based on satellite images that are pro uh, produced by Digital Globe, Planet Labs, and others, uh, Airbus Defense. Um, so in the concept, conceptual part of the paper, we argue that the refugee camp is sort of neither simply an apolitical space to provide shelter and protection as a sort of the humanitarian discourse would, would uh, say, nor is it just the technology of power to control movement, although that is certainly one of the, its functions. Um, instead, we hold that sort of the refugee camp is a complex assemblage, as we say, maybe network is a, maybe an easier term. To, um, of heterogeneous elements. So you have, you have like infrastructures, you have human actors, you have technologies, discourses, rules. And then uh, secondly, this network is not bounded by the actual physical borders of the camp space, but also comprises a broader network of international actors, legislations, uh, technologies, um, set, such as space infrastructures and so on. And then third, we argue that the key function of this network is to render refugee legible, right? So for example, through a particular architecture, through a particular sort of ordering of space, through the application of surveillance technologies and so on. So the result is what we call a selective transparency. So the inside of the camp is sort of hidden from the eyes of direct neighbors because it's hidden behind a wall or fence. But it's visible, for example, to the satellite image uh, sitting in Geneva, right? So that, that's what we call is the selective transparency of the camp. And then in the paper, we uh, sort of go on to discuss the implications of this growing commercialization and increasing availabil availability of digital technologies over the past yeah, 15, 10 years, uh, like satellite remote sensing in the field of humanitarian and migration governance. Um, so based on this perspective that I've just outlined on this network assemblage perspective, we argue that these developments can be understood as sort of a reassembling, reorganization of the refugee camp, of the entire network that I presented on the previous slide. Uh, so first we have novel actors entering the described network. So on this slide, you can see just a few of such actors, including satellite businesses like Digital Globe or Planet, we have international organizations such as UNISAT, uh, so it's a um, United Nations organization, or uh, EU's, uh, the European Union's um, Copernicus program, uh, so it's an Earth observation program. You have public and private research organizations, um, and you have NGOs. And, and sort of this trend then reinforces the decent decentralization and the privatization of refugee camp governance. Um, and then secondly, the refugee camp through this process is sort of rendered increasingly mobile in the form of digital images, of satellite images, of maps. It, it sort of circulates through the vast networks of news media, bureaucracies, research agencies, NGOs, and so on. And third, these developments, of course, offer new possibilities of controlling and surveilling refugees. But it can also lead to contestation on politicization. For example, when camp inhabitants or NGOs use such imagery to highlight, uh, let's say, the miserable living conditions in, in particular camps. Um, so in the empirical part of the paper, we then go on to study the manifold ways of sort of seeing the refugee camp that are enabled or foreclosed by uh, digital technologies. And in the first step, we study, uh, one could say, the visual discourse on, on these uh, two camps, uh, Zatari and Azraq, by major humanitarian organizations such as UNHCR. Um, and in this official political discourse, satellite remote sensing is sort of praised as an opportunity of monitoring and thus managing the camp more effectively, basically. So the satellite view is presented as a sort of distanced and neutral um, an objective perspective 
And in this reading, the camp is mainly a technology of control and care and, and satellites and other seeing machines would sort of enhance the efficiency of this machine. And in the second step, we then go on and perform our own uh, cluster analysis or spatial statistics uh, based on satellite um, data of these two camps. Um, and in so doing, we, we kind of try to reenact the cyber humanitarian gaze at these camps. And what we found is that sort of the resulting maps that we pr produced of a Zatari, uh, which is the camp on the image uh, above on the right, um, sort of are marked by a high degree of spatial distortion of noise and disorder. So there, there are many visible hotspots where the population seems to lack proper access to services and amenities. And, um, and there are, are uh, Azraq camp space, on the other hand, appears highly ordered, like with shelters organized in orderly lines around facility buildings. And what you can also see on the image is that the camp consists of several um, villages with almost no connection between them. So that's the, the image below on the right side. So the distant um, machine view of these camps strongly resonates with the dominant Western discourse on these two camps, where Zatari is often described as chaotic, squalid, and crime-ridden, whereas Azra uh, Azraq is seen as one of the best planned refugee camps in the world. And then we contrast sort of the remote machine view of the camp with the field observations and interviews conducted by Christiana in both camps. Um, and what we found is that the situation on the ground differs quite a lot um, from, from this view. And this is mainly because of what remains sort of hidden from the satellite gaze. Uh, so um, <clears throat> based on uh, her participant observation, we show that sort of what looks like chaos and disorder from above turns out to be more sort of often more organic, vibrant, livable, and in the end, sustainable. Um, so, so what looks like chaotic dwelling actually represents a way of inhabiting of inhabitants like turning the camp into their home by altering the camp infrastructure, establishing what uh, what uh, Christiana describes as sort of shaded atrium of sorts, um, bordered by three or four Nissen huts, and then sort of that provide shelter to families of forty members or, or more. So, what appears as noise and distortion on satellite images and um, and cluster maps. It turns out to be an, an important source of agency and, and sort of resilience. Uh, for example, uh, buildings that look like functioning toilets and wash, washrooms uh, in satellite images then turn out to be empty shells because their interiors have been sort of um, integrated into self-constructed living areas. And in Azraq, on the contrary, there is no public space comparable to, to Zatari. Uh, um, so while the modern facility of the camp sort of are, are very intact, a life in Azraq was mostly sterile. Uh, so many of the shelter buildings were in fact unoccupied because uh, quite a lot of the arriving refugees leave the camp again within a short time. Um, so in short, in Zatari, the interaction with camp infrastructure represents a source of agency and resilience, while the ordered structure of Azraq seems to have sort of a disempowering effect on, on the camp inhabitants. Um, so in our view, what becomes visible here to, through this sort of view from below is kind of another reality of the camp. Um, one in which the refugees are not merely data points or helpless victims, sort of, of omnipresent surveillance, but active political subjects pursuing their own agendas. Um, so in the case of Azraq, in which camp infrastructure is fixed and immutable, refugees resist government uh, humanitarian logic simply by leaving, for example. In Zatari, the inhabitants appropriate and hack, kind of hack the camp infrastructure, thereby resisting the governmental logics of the camp. Um, so in a sort of dialectical move, one could say, we then argue that humanitarian actors try then to turn these frictions and, and, and sort of failures that result from, from these uh, two competing, yeah, one could say, versions of the camp, they kind of try to harness that and, and turn that into a productive resource. 
by drawing on a range of sort of experimental forms of governance um, and technology-based forms of governance. So in, in Azraq, the static and sterile character of the infrastructure prevents on the one hand many social activities in the camp, but then it also allowed to test new forms of digital surveillance, like uh, for example, the automated allocation of shelters. And this became only possible because Azraq doesn't have tents, but static buildings. Uh, that cannot be uh, sort of changed and, and moved around. And in Zatari, on the other hand, um, yeah, we discuss an example where UNISAT conducted a project in which they sort of trained um, inhabitants in uh, geographic information systems. Um, so to basically to, to um, create their own digital maps and as a sort of tools to empower them to produce their own maps of the camp. And, and the aim was here really to, to sort of create a sense of their own vulnerabilities uh, of the inhabitants and sort of to, to activate their potential for self-help. Um, in, in our view, this, this is um, a perfect example um, of, yeah, um, of what has been called sort of resiliency interventionism. So it, the aim is sort of in line with certain neoliberal political discourse really to, to create a sense of self-responsibility and, and self-government uh, by the um, camp inhabitants. So to wrap up, um, first of all, uh, there is no neutral way, neutral way of seeing or showing refugee camps. And this is something that Eva has already pointed out in her introduction, because um, the view is always mediated through a range of technologies, theories, knowledges, and so on, and thus always linked to power. Um, and this is important as sort of Western European researchers, we're not located outside of these networks of power, but we're sort of operating from, from within. So um, also our perspective on the ground sort of is not an unmediated view. It's still uh, mediated and still operating from within these networks of power. Um, then the application of visual technologies such as satellite remote sensing changes how refugee camps can be seen and thus governed. However, refugees are not and camp inhabitants are not helpless victims in this process, but actively resist their surveillance. Um, and our ana analysis shows three, yeah, one could say enactments of the camp. Uh, first of all, as a technology of control and care. Secondly, as lived in political space. And sort of thirdly, as a governmental laboratory and space of experimentation. And yeah, that's it from my side. Uh, many thanks for your attention and attention. And I'm looking very much forward to questions, comments, and the discussion. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Dov, very much for this. And I would um, immediately turn um, to uh, Christine. Christine, if you are ready, and, and then we will the discussion um, have the discussion of both inputs afterwards. So that was super interesting, and and thank you for uh, for having me uh, at this talk, and and hi to everyone in the audience as well. Um, so I really enjoyed this presentation, and I really think. As researchers, you know, we, we need also need to engage critically on how we work on this. And, and I was just thinking sort of my background is law, right? So a lot of my tinkering with the technology has actually been through working out codes of conduct and, and participating in standard setting events, which is, is I guess, how the lawyer gets hands on. Um, I'll be presenting something for you today, which is sort of a work in progress. And I hope that this can be kind of a helpful way for all of us to think uh, think through um, some larger questions um, in what I'm calling extractive humanitarianism. Um, and it's actually not quite true that I'm calling it extractive humanitarianism. I had a very long title for my book and one of the reviewers just replied that this was sort of boring and we should go with this instead. And I've been a little ambivalent, but I'm sort of warming up to it, right? So if you look at what extraction is, you know, tending toward the resulting and withdrawal of natural resources by extraction with no provision for replenishment. 
you know, that's not quite what's going on, but, but I think it's a way of thinking about it, which is helpful. While on the other hand, humanitarianism is, is having concern for or helping to improve the welfare and happiness of people pertaining to the saving of human lives or to the alleviation of human suffering. Um, so what I'll do now is I'll, this is the table of contents for my book as it stands, and I'll, I'll hold up some sort of general issues that I'm thinking about at the moment, which can help us frame both a critique of, of humanitarian innovation and digital humanitarianism as we know it, but also how we can sort of set the stage for critical inquiry and, and research going forward. Um, so my background is human rights activism. I was, you know, spent time working on children's rights, but also children's digital rights from, from actually the mid nineties and, and working in Uganda. Um, and then I've done my PhD work on resettlement and then I had lots of kids. So I had to do a postdoc at home, which turned out to be in cyber war. And, and as you see, all of these things have sort of merged beautifully. So, so in my book, I've been, and, and this book has, has gotten a kicking from, from good friends, so I'm, I'm still working on all the chapters, but, you know, there are certain things I'm interested in. I'm very interested in sort of humanitarian innovation as a structural paradigm and, and what's new and what's not. So at the moment, and this is why I'll, I'll show this to you, um, I'm struggling with chapter one here the production of expertise and, and looking at UNICEF's wearable for good competition. It's six, six years old, but it's, it's an interesting example of, of a long-standing trend towards partnerships whereby humanitarian organizations uh, try to work with the private sector one way or another. And, you know, this isn't private-public partnerships isn't something new. Um, so I also tend to emphasize that 2009 is the starting point for the humanitarian innovation movement, but, but I'm, I'm also trying to sort of pick up more nuances here. And, and I'm a little bit bothered by my own tendency to sort of label everything as, as neoliberal. And, and so I'm trying to understand, you know, more about what's going on in the field and, and has been going on for a while. Um, I mean, I've been in this humanitarian innovation field for about a decade. Um, but, but it's always good to start, you know, try to criticize your own work. I'm also interested in the production of global humanitarian innovation space from below. I spent a couple of years uh, as part of a project, Dep Labs by the Sturt Network, um, on being an ethics advisor. Um, I'm interested in humanitarian cyberspace. This is chapter four, uh, and, and particularly this production of risk. I'm interested in drones, obviously, and, and the politics of humanitarian airspace. Um, and then I'll, I'm interested in wearables and I'm interested in digital bodies and ethics, um, but I'm also interested in sort of the new remoteness. Uh, you know, there's lots of scholarship on externalization, but, but there's a question as to how the pandemic and, and digital tools uh, continue to sort of offshore uh, both protection procedures uh, but also the ability to to you know get protection from from international refugee law, for example, and and you know the, the contribution of technology here. So so you know as you see, I, I sort of have a lot of things I'm thinking with, and and here and, and I'll I'll walk you through some of the motivating ideas, and and the reason that I'm I'm showing you this sort of very unfinished product is that you know you guys as students, it you know this is just a lot of ideas and, and you have other good ideas, but, but just to show you that it's a really wide field where, where, you know, lots of areas haven't even been properly researched. So, you know, just try to find something that no one has looked at and then it's gonna be fascinating for you. Um, so I'll, I'll start with the questions and then a little bit on how we can calibrate critique here and then look at examples of extraction. And then I have just a couple of topical examples. So the, the first one is, is this notion of what we're actually dealing with here. Um, and it's taken me, you know, it's taken a while for me to realize that this is more than just add-ons. It's more than a series of innovation processes with, with a focus on, on gadgets. So we are in the middle of a sort of a massive digital transformation. And, and we have been for a long time, but, but the notion that this is a transformation has seems to have been 
surfacing a lot more over the last two or three years. So basically, it's, it's integrating IC technology within aid organizations, no longer as an add-on, but to transform how organizations operate um, and um, fulfills their mandate and achieves impact. And then, you know, everybody has been in this, this business of converting and managing information. Um, aid has been uh, subjected to datafication. Um, so everything has been in converted into readable formats. Um, I think uh, there are also really interesting work out now on how the digital is, is leading to dematerializing aid. Uh, so everything is, is more about sort of providing a digital supply chain, for example, instead of actually providing physical aid or material aid. Then there's this sprawling digital infrastructure. And, and I, 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 I slot this under the label governance technology. Sometimes it, it's based on public interest, very often it's not, but it, it's really massive. And part of the problem with this governance technology is that you have organizations like UNICEF and, and even more UNHCR, where you have a huge crowd of researchers uh, who are interested, who've been paying attention for a long time and who have access to actually do the field research. But then you have organizations like the World Food Program, a very powerful, uh, lots of interesting, interesting things going on digitally um, with the World Food Program, very controversial um, collaboration with Palantir, but we simply don't know a lot about this. You know, not many people are experts on the World Food Program. Everyone seems to have clustered around, you know, Doctors Without Borders, ICRC, UNHCR, and, and I'm no exception here. Uh, but, but it, you know, it makes me think that we're, we're facing a gap uh, with respect to capacity. Then obviously production of a vast range of digital humanitarian goods, everything from sort of shelters to wearables, to drones, et cetera, et cetera. And, and then something which is increasingly obvious to me in the sort of more narrow domain of refugee law is this is sort of the, the wandering of legal tech into asylum procedures and, and what it does to refugee protection. So, so there are transformations on a number of levels and, and we call the technology different things. I mean, they belong to different types of, of, of discourses and I haven't even touched on ed tech here, which is of course massive. Um, so what, what are the types of changes this transformation brings about, right? And, and what are the implications for the future aid? And, and I mean, I see many people in, in the sort of in the chat, in the audience here who, who are doing important work at this. So this is just my basic suggestions. So, you know, at the start of this, it was appropriated by the humanitarian sector as just a series of, of projects uh, that were supposed to fix the system. Um, so, you know, endemic problems of being fit for purpose or, you know, being uh, having security problems or shrinking or whatever. So, you know, tech and innovation would make humanitarians better, faster, stronger and, and more secure. Uh, we've also seen a massive linking up with new partners. So a number of partners have started to call themselves humanitarian. So World Bank, for example, UN Habitat, lots of new startups, big tech. Um, and then also new types of projects. So proxy means welfare testing, for example, and, and sort of social innovation. Um, so the vulnerability assessment framework in, in Jordan, for example, uh, is, is proxy means testing people, giving them social protection, uh, maybe instead of legal protection. And then lots of new activities, such as banking, for example. So, so the core of humanitarianism is, is also shifting in a way. So, so this is changing the who and the how and the what, um, but, but also, and, and this is where sort of, yes, I'm ending back in this critique of the neoliberal, but, but it's really pushing humanitarianism towards data governance and marketization in ways that need to be explored. Um, and and I'm, my goal is sort of to try not to be lazy, you know, like, like in 2001, everything could be explained by that it was globalization and it was probably bad. And then we've gone through this, it's, uh, you know, it's neoliberal and it's bad. And, and I'm, I'm hoping not to end up with some sort of explanatory framework where everything is the fault of big tech and it's definitely bad, right? Um, so what does it do? Um, it's shifting the way we produce knowledge and expertise. 
um, and, and what kind of knowledge counts. So there's been lots of, of criticism or research on the turn to quantitative knowledge, for example, indicators and, and you know, benchmarking uh, in humanitarianism, but, but also more generally in human rights governance. And I think this, 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 this idea of quantification as a way of knowing the world, I think it's an interesting critique. Um, what I've noticed is, is for us, when I started working on um, results-based management in, in refugee studies, is that nobody had done the work. So there's lots and lots of scholarship on new public management and quantification, but nobody had really looked seriously into results-based management which entered uh, at least refugee management in the late 1990s. So it's like we're, we're missing this bridge, um, uh, which is, is increasingly getting digitized in how our organizations operate. And we, we haven't done the critical work. Then, of course, humanitarian space is, is, is reconfigured in multiple ways, as the previous speaker uh, explained very eloquently but also how the digital transformation reshapes, you know, production attributes and distribution of aid. Um, I've been particularly interested in, in the digital body and, and how that body is aided and protected and left unprotected. Um, there are of course many other ways of, of imagining this. Um, and, and then there's the secondly, the question of calibrating critique. So um, a techno-utopianist progress narrative the field has certainly been very um, determined to either really, or stakeholders to sort of be very skeptical with respect to technology or just completely uncritical and, and you know, be super excited about everything. Um, and, and then in particular, I'm, I'm a little skeptical about this technology improves accountability uh, tourism. On the other hand, technology can also improve accountability. Um, and, and this is where we're left with this quandary, right? So in the past, information was very scarce and now we might have an overload of information, um, but there isn't really golden age either, right? So, so we have to try to navigate this um, some way or another. Very often it's claimed that it's faster and cheaper, you know, that sometimes begs uh, belief. And, and then there's this idea that technology is, is neutral and that people, good or bad, fill technology with meaning. And I don't think technology is neutral. Uh, I think technology has politics and, and we are as researchers uh, responsible for unpacking the politics. Um, but then there's the question of how we do this, right? So data colonialism has, has been and data relations, and data justice have sort of surfaced as, as very um, popular and, and uh, useful ways of, of making sense of what's going on in, in a justice perspective. Uh, on the other hand, uh, particularly a set of Latin American researchers have taken exception to the use of data colonialism, um, reflecting that, you know, okay, so there is practices, our practices combining kind of predatory extractive practices of historical colonialism with, with you know, data surveillance, for example. Um, on the other hand, historically, colonialism had real violence. Um, so it's bad if somebody abuses your personal data um, and, and, you know, and, and transgresses on your, your privacy. And identity theft is, is horrible, uh, but is it violence? Is it the same as is your village being burnt, right? And, and I'm, I'm very humble. Uh, with respect to how we, we think about this. Uh, and and I, I think it's difficult. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm finding myself very much a student of how we can think about this. Um, so what kind of is drug extraction? And here I'm just gonna go through, I, I don't, I don't wanna overspend my time, but I'm interrogating some types of extraction. And, and I think there are many ways of, of doing this. So, so the first one is, um, you know, the properties of humanitarian innovation themselves. You know, what sort of buzzword is this? What sort of kind of fad is this? You know, what's the theory of change here? Um, who has duties? And, and I think maybe the most sort of scary thing for me with the humanitarian innovation framework is this idea that, um, 
one of the benefits of an innovation approach is that you know we sort of dissolve this, this old fashioned business of rights and duties. I mean, I, I think that's not such a great idea. You know, if every if nobody has duties anymore, but lots and lots of room for intervention, um, you know, that's basically flattening accountability. Um, and, and I also think that we should do a better job as researchers in really trying to track uh, partnerships. So in my, my study of, of the wearables for good, I've tracked the partnership uh, between UNICEF and Frog, which is a global um, sort of innovation design company, back to 2010. While uh, ARMS, which is a sort of computing company, a uh, large one, started with the wearables for good competition. Um, it's difficult for me to figure out whether these are collaborations and partnerships or whether they're actually based on procurement and contracts. Um, it's also difficult for me to learn uh, enough about you know, who the stakeholders are and, and what the personal relationships are. But, but I think we need to take the relationships more seriously. The UN has good web pages for relisting procurements, um, but hopefully we can sort of follow the money more than we do now. Um, then I think we need to pay more attention to risks. Uh, so at least, and what you hear in the background is my short haired German pointer puppy, who's now upset about something. Sorry if you hear barking. Um, technology creates new risks. Um, I can ex sort of report from, from the field of, of institutional humanitarian innovation that it's, it took a long time for many of the NGOs accept that they were now subjecting their, their clients or recipients to real risk by, by recording their data, for example, that they had themselves become threat actors. Um, and, and I think it's important that we as researchers don't become you know, judgmental. Humanitarians are not accountable for eliminating all risks. Um, but they're accountable for understanding the nature and the potential and impact of these risks, right? And, and I think this is kind of the line of interrogation we, we should pursue. There, there's a very interesting um, a discussion currently going on about biometrics and, and you know, UNHCR's responsibility for having taken the biometrics of, of uh, refugees, Rohingya refugees. And, and that these data were eventually uh, circulated back to the government of Myanmar. Um, and, and, you know, there's a huge crowd of, of very angry re researchers, but, but maybe we should be more interested in what happens within the organizations and do that sort of boring work. And I'm also speaking clearly about my own scholarship here. But we need to understand the risks, right? And, and general risks, risks that compromise the protection of individuals, risks that compromise our protection infrastructure. Um, and then compromises protection processes in themselves. So before you have hoarded a lot of data, you know, that data point doesn't constitute a risk, but once you have it, it's a target. Um, I've been ransomware, my computer was killed. I, you know, can you imagine humanitarian organizations being ransomware, for example? Um, and, and obviously there are problems of criminality. Um, which are hard to counter, but there is also the question of due diligence, right? And, and what you need to be able to protect yourself. And, and then there's this question of digital experimentation, you know, use of untested approaches in insecure and unstable displacement contexts. And, and, and you know, the preference for experimenting quite a lot and, and, you know, how frequent it is that you see quite astonishing projects being deployed in, in the field in Africa, for example, that would not be uh, legitimate to do within the European Union, for example. And then I think once, you know, if, if you discover those kind of projects, um, you know, I think that's where you need to start tracing what's going on. And then there's the question of how we think about digital divides and digital shadows um, and, and what it actually means to to have those divides in those shadows. So, you know, how do we know that, you know, people have an equal access? How do you provide data to prove this? And how do you think about it? But also how you think about protection being wrapped around digital structures. 
um, which means that if you are not connected or if you have no digital literacy, you risk being underserved. And, and here it should be noted that it's very difficult today to get legal protection without uh, and a legal identity without also having a digital identity and have given up literally all your data. Um, and then this, you know, this means that we need to pay attention to how we create a digital body. Um, so, you know, the provision of, of data about the body, uh, it, as I said, it's a precondition for receiving aid, but it also means that no longer is only the operational system at risk, but I'm at risk. So if I report that I've been raped so-and-so by so-and-so member of this and this clan, if this data leaks, you know, I'm in mortal danger. And this is only one of the many examples, right? Um, but, but again, did this means that humanitarian organizations also need to be positioned as threat actors? And there's also a question of, of you know, how this data is stored. You know, they never delete the data. It's difficult to manage uh, data that, that's false or inaccurate in, in you know, clients of the humanitarian system or people are, have very little ability to you know, get access to their own data. And then the question of how this data travels, for example, UNHCR gives up resettlement data to the uh, Department of Homeland Security, um, even though people are not ever resettled or even in a serious process. Um, and then, you know, of course, data is sold. And, and, you know, data, refugee data is also commercial research resource. So, so the digital body needs, um, needs attention. I'm getting to the end here. And then there's this infrastructure humanitarianism. I, I talked about the World Food Program. They have something called SCOPE. Here is UNHCR Primes. Um, I mean, this is a massive system, very interesting. Also interesting to see how it sort of comes together. And, and I would very much welcome serious academic interest into this, this system um, to see how we can try to understand it, to see how we can get an overview of who's actually involved as stakeholders and, and you know, how well the various components work out and, and work together. So this is, is maybe if I can say anything, you know, it's this D is probably the most sort of in need of research uh, topic that I'll talk about today. Um, and, and, you know, this means that databases have become sexy, right? I mean, the this is a type of knowledge management, which is familiar from non-humanitarian sectors, uh, but it's really something that we need to think about. You know, it's a key site for producing social meaning, but it's also a key site for understanding the types of rights and obligations at play in the humanitarian field. Um, and then algorithmic knowledge and the challenges, particularly to legal protection issues, which is what I'm interested in. But, but generally, this, this, this notion of, of sort of black boxes across the humanitarian field, where, where needs, you know, how much I need to eat, what kind of welfare my family should receive, how likely I am to succeed as a resettlement candidate, starts to populate uh, humanitarian aid more and more. So, so we need to understand them and unpack them. Uh, and we also need to sort of think about how they relate, for example, to ethics or to the legal obligations that organizations and countries have. And I, I think I'll end there. Um, uh, this is just a lot, but, but I, I hope this can be some sort of, of overview of, of where we think about humanitarianism as an extractive practice where data, the, produce, the data producing ability of, of the bodies so of refugees and other people in, in need of protection and aid have really become, if, if not the only game in town, a very important part of humanitarian action and contemporary humanitarianism. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, we, we don't have an opportunity for applause um, uh, 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 here. Um, yeah, thank both of you, and I think um, both talks like kind of um, spoke very well to 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 each other, and uh, also struggling with like a similar thing. I think in kind of how can we as academics also engage with with these developments, yeah, and um, delve kind of um, um, present us with with this uh, opportunity of kind of trying to kind of experiment with what. It's actually happening 
um, as a researcher itself. So now I would like to invite the audience, um, if you want to make a comment or ask a question, please post a B or an S um, in the chat. So there's one uh, question, but I don't see from who it is. So I will, um, um, there's a question, I will read it out as, um, but we would um, prefer, I think it, it would be nice if you could uh, ask a question yourself, but I will read the question, um, which is uh, generally speaking, humanitarians are not exactly known for their digital literacy. How can this be addressed? Well, I, I mean, I, I think, you know, partially this is just about hiring and then time passing, right? So, you know, people who've been in the system for a long time have sort of, are not specialists, but then a lot of new people coming into the system are specialists, right? So the question I think is more, what kind of digital literacy do you need at either side of the table, right? And then how important is digital literacy to humanitarian operations? Um, and, and, you know, and, and not only what's your remedy as, uh, I keep saying client, it, it's because I don't really know what to say, right? So beneficiaries is definitely out and intended beneficiaries sound wishy-washy. Um, but, you know, like, like as, as a, as a, I, I looked at Unichair's data protection policies, for example, and, and data strategies, and, you know, there's nothing about law. It's all about creating a culture of data protection. And I'm like, what? I mean, these are potential life and death issues. They, you know, these things have norms. You know, this is not about you creating a culture in your little office. You need to sort of step up. It's your job. You can't endanger people. And, and so, I, I mean, I would say that the, to the extent that this is how things are talked about, uh, it's a more serious systemic problem. On the other hand, I realized that I've come full circle and I now tend to see law as the solution for everything. You know, having worked on ethics for a decade, most of the people that I've been hanging out with, we have decided that we need hard norms now. We're done with law. No, we're done with ethics. We're ready for like court cases and, and more lawyers. Okay, thank you, Christine. Now, I think we have a question by uh, Dennis Dagsoy. Um, so, Max, can you... Allow Dennis to ask his question, please. Dennis, you must unmute yourself, I think. He's probably going to answer, ask a question about humanitarian order. So Dennis and I are working on a book project. Uh, hello, Dennis. Dennis, you have to unmute yourself, I think. I'm really sorry. My son just gave me a call at the same moment. So um, I am, yeah, I will have to call him back in a few uh, minutes. Um, so I was also out of the discussion for a, a few minutes. Anyway, hi, Kristin. Good to uh, see you. Um, yeah, my question had to do with the boring work uh, that you just uh, mentioned, um, uh, Kristin, in your um, um, uh, speech, because um, that's actually the work within the organization. So I would love it if, um, and this is so there's a methodological aspect to my question, you know, if either the people who work in, say, UNHCR or another uh, humanitarian organization could be involved in this, uh, um, um, yeah, in this line of uh, research. Um, you know, and we don't necessarily need to wait for a humanitarian Snowden to, to come out and expose problems that are there with uh, um, um, uh, digital data in uh, humanitarian organizations. Um, and at the same time, the same person may say, oh, there are also some really some good things going on that weren't possible uh, before. Um, so the first question is, can you work more with either the persons in the organizations or can you work more with the, in this case, refugees themselves? And that, that so, um, 
and then the second part of my question, that's actually more for um, uh, Delph, and that is, what can you do? Or did you guys think about how you could strengthen the position or how you could involve the refugees in the camps themselves, either to do research or uh, to be able to interact in a different manner with the humanitarian organizations or more broadly, the humanitarian ecosystem? Thank you. Okay, so maybe, uh, Dave, I think that's also a question maybe concerning your work. Yeah, I can, I can try to answer uh, a couple of things uh, that came up. Um, yeah, and, and I think it all uh, relates to each other in terms of how to create sort of digital liter literacy of humanitarians. Um, and, and to me, the question is sort of what kind of knowledge are you uh, going, going to train, right? Because it's, I mean, and I, I think there are a lot of training activities going on already through UNITAR and, and other organizations, so a lot of uh, seminars, webinars, and so on, where you can g gain the sort of, yeah, the literacy and sort of the technical knowledge about, um, yeah, different tools and how to apply them. Um, but then it's sort of, there's another another type of knowledge that is crucial and needed here, and it's more sort of a, a more a bit more self reflect self ref, reflexive uh, form of knowledge, I would say, and it concerns the, it concerns the questions of what such tools are doing, right? So because we, to me, I think we as societies, as even maybe as global society, we are not at all sort of comprehending what social media, what Twitter, what digital technologies are doing to sort of reshape um, the show, the social world, right? So, so it's a bit of kind of a, a huge experiment in in this sense, and of course, this also applies to the field of of humanitarian um, technologies. And um, so, I think much more sort of self reflexive uh, work. Um, could be done here, and I think it would be great to have joined uh, also research projects. And um, I mean, even our small group is, uh, yeah, uh, maybe uh, just a small example, basically because Miguel he's, he's really coming from a very different uh, perspective, and he has been using these technologies and, um, yeah, in a very positivist way to produce uh, knowledge about sort of mobile populations, and uh, sort of now we. Are beginning to to um, to uh, cooperate um, to learn from each other. So also um, and and yeah, trying to understand what these tools are doing. So the next project would be uh, we've just applied for a small grant to to do with students uh, to um, to program a little sort of agent based model, so a computer model to uh, sort of um, simulate a situation of forced displacement, and then sort of trying to work with the students to understand the sort of um, uh, sort of. Um, yeah, forms of knowledge production and underlying forms of violence and so on. Um, so we haven't thought about working with uh, the refugees in these camps. I think, I mean, it would be possible. Uh, of, of course, it's always a question, sort of a, a very practical question. You need to have a sort of contact and so on. And it's, uh, yeah, there's also always a question of power and, and positionality and, and so on, uh, um, of ethics, research ethics, of course, always involved uh, when you do that. But um, yeah, so... Uh, uh, to say that these um, sort of technologies have a politics, they are not neutral, doesn't mean that they couldn't be used in the other ways, right? In sort of progressive ways, in ways that uh, could be used by camp inhabitants themselves to sort of, um, yeah, to, to um, yeah, ba basically to resist, to, to, um, to make a change and so on. So, um, yeah, it's a good su suggestion. Thanks. Thank you, Dev. Christian, I assume that you also maybe want to react to uh, Dennis' question. Okay. Well, I mean, I, I think I think a lot of the work on technology is going on uh, together with humanitarian organizations. But, but you know, there's a we've been through this phase of, of sort of trying to figure out what's going on. So there's been a lot of trying to name and conceptualize and, and trying to create some sort of map. And, you know, there's a lot of Foucault in this field still, and Foucault has a lot to contribute, but, you know, it does help if people know 
you know, what the humanitarian space looks like and have so, some engagement. Um, I think I forgot the other part of Dennis's question. I was um, just listening to Delph. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so maybe then Dennis must uh, we we go on and and hopefully Dennis uh, with you 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 are in in contact I assume so uh, anyway both so yes we are and I need to call my son back okay <laughs> bye bye um, oh bye Dennis um then Susanna Jaspers is uh, next so um we will uh, hear her question I think. Zana, um, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Oh, okay. Sorry, I haven't done this before. I, now I can't see my question anymore. Um, anyway, yes, no, I actually wrote it down. I mean, it's basically, I've also been really, um, well, I'm, I'm starting to, I mean, I've, I'm sorry, I've, I'm, I, I work on food issues uh, and have done for the last 30 years. Um, and I'm only just beginning to ask questions myself about scope. And it's, it's, it's something that's kind of been come, you know, come across, come to my attention, but haven't focused much on it. And now starting to think about kind of digitization of food assistance. It's like scope. What do I know about it? Nothing. What does anybody else know about it? Nothing. Um, you know, I've been asking around work, particularly in Somalia and Sudan and, um, you know, whether there's been any kind of evaluations, any kind of reports, questions about it. And what's also clear is that, you know, um, it's not just humanitarian assistance. This is much bigger. I mean, they're also working with the World Bank now on kind of social protection programs. So this is this is a massive thing. So, um, yeah, why? Why? Why haven't any of us looked at this before and why why aren't uh, you know the um, uh, humanitarians or others asking or, or governments asking questions about it and what i mean is kind of you know like the government of sudan for example oh i'm so glad you're you're sort of you're the one to sort of say this Susanna. i mean you know you are an exceptionally capable researcher and and extremely knowledgeable and i i think you know, just having someone uh, with your understanding of, of a food assistant be interested in this is, is fantastic. Um, I, I think the social protection issue is is very important, particularly as, as you know, de you dematerialize aid. Everything becomes about logistics and data, but people still need to physically eat, right? Uh, and what does it mean that the World Food Program is doing so many other things? And, and you know, where does the World Bank come in? So it's social protection but it's also this social innovation field of, of new actors that are humanitarian mm. slash in aid slash insecurity and wants to earn money yeah and and just to understand this ecosystem and it, it's it's sort of it has emerged quite rapidly um and and you know and then you end up with for example the blockchain i have to tell you a funny story about the blockchain right so the humanitarians had these I hype don't cycles about that either <laughs> okay so 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 the hype cycles you know it used to be drones and then it was uh, it's been cell phones drones um and then it you know it's been artificial intelligence the last year but three years ago it was blockchain and i was on this this mailing list and it was pretty clear that people understood that it was a way of transferring money without you know the to ensure full trust and eliminate corruption and you know making sure that things had integrity but it was pretty clear that a lot of people thought it was a physical thing so they started wondering about how the blockchain could deliver money into the drc congo and at some point some person from the norwegian refugee council who's an expert in this just says you know sorry you guys but you need an atm you actually need physical structures. Data isn't going to solve everything for you. And, and I think this you know, speaks to this landscape where we're all sort of am amateurs, right? So you finally manage to get the satellites or the drones under your belt, and then something completely new and relevant shows up. It's an agency you never heard about. And then you're like, whoops. Um, so, so I think you know, we're all sharing this. Um, and then, but it's a great journey to travel together, I think. And, and this is where I really would encourage the students to not do your research on very well-trodden paths or refugee populations, but try to see if you can find a different angle. 
Okay, so then thank you, um, Christine. Thank you, uh, Susanne Aspas. Um, Christine Adesanya has the next uh, question. Christine, Max will. Yes, um, my question is actually um, I am very much focused on the resilience end of the spectrum of the humanitarian spectrum. And I, I would like to find out, I know that organizations are already, like Christine said earlier, using blockchain technology to um, work on cash and voucher assistance in different places. I would like to find out how digit, digital transformation can transcend this, the current process into resilience, for example, into building resilience for sustainable solutions. Okay, maybe Dev, do you want to, because I know that you are <laughs> uh, in general very well uh, versed in the resilience discourse, um, uh, maybe not in the merits. Can, do you want to, uh, can you say something on, on, on this question? Sure, I can. I can uh, at least I can try. I mean, it's not a. There's no um, straightforward answer to the, to that question. I think, but I, I think, uh, I, I mean, any form of resilience always um, requires um, that sort of things need to be worked out um, together with uh, stakeholders or people that are affected for example, by uh, technological change or by environmental risks and so on, right? So um, I think um, if there is like one crucial or com sort of common assumption in all, all different takes on resins, it's probably that you, it can't be imposed from above, right? So it has to be sort of, I mean, you can try to, to nurture it uh, in a sense by providing sort of knowledge and so on but you can't just impose it from above, right? So in, yeah, as a humanitarian worker uh, coming from an international organization or a Western background or so. So, um, so I think that's, that's one uh, answer to, to the question that, um, that there have to be ways in which digital technologies uh, become useful for people I mean, um, yeah, in, in the context in which these are being uh, applied. And um, yeah, again, this is a yeah, difficult process because it's uh, related to all sorts of yeah, questions of power and, and, and imbalances and so on. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's all I can say from my side or for my work on resilience, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Christine, do you want to, to add something or should we go to the next question? I think we'll, we'll move to the next. Um, I mean, I, I think it's an eloquent question, but it's also a very difficult one to answer. Um, <laughs> and, and, and I have to say that I, I, I struggle so much with sort of the resilience discourse in the first place and how you know, people are resilient. I mean, they're alive. You know, they manage to protect their, their family. I mean, they're extremely resilient. And for sort of a top-down humanitarian provider to come and teach them how to be resilient. I mean, I simply can't think of anything more ridiculous, right? So, so, so but that's different from competence building, right? And I've, I mean, with, with the organizations, I've gone through, for example, the steps in innovation processes, and it's been super useful, you know, to be a student. And participate in, in these workshops right so so competency building fine but 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 this idea that you know you and HR can teach somebody to be resilient nah not so much okay thank you um then I, we have two questions from Katrin Ola uh, because they are uh, it's very general so I don't know Katrin do you want maybe to ask them them yourself Maximia can we do that Katrin Ola, yeah, we can hear you, I think. Okay, perfect. Um, yes, I would like to know, uh, or thanks, at all, first of all, for your very interesting uh, presentations. I would like to know, um, I think you already spoke a little bit about it, uh, Christine Sandvik, about the role of data sharing and data protection. 
And I would like to know, especially or in regard of beneficiaries, how do you see, um, how could this be improved? And what is also the role of the humanitarians in this context? What, and what does it need to, to improve the situation of data sharing and data protection? Maybe there are a lot of questions now. <laughs> that was an endlessly large question. So, I mean, I think, you know, that this concern we currently have with, with data protection and, and privacy, it's, it's partly a European thing, right? Because we have the GDPR and finally Europe is, and I count Norway as Europe for once, we're sort of good at something, right? Mm -hmm. but, but the organizations themselves, they have immunity. Um, so, so, so I think for us as researchers, you know, I think we have to try to understand, you know, how are these concepts and, and, and standards applied? And so, for example, the vulnerability assistance framework was uh, folded and, and folded into RICE, which is the Refugee Assistant Information Systems. You know, how did these data travel? What happened when the data, you know, when, when one system closed? Could you get your data deleted, for example, if you're no longer a refugee? And, and I mm -hmm. found one person who was interested in speaking to me about this, right? Uh, about what had happened three years ago, uh, because he had sort of created the World Ability Assessment Framework himself. But then my way of trying to understand the data protection ret retroactively was, you know, same old stuff. You sort of sit there and you try to make contact with people and you try mm -hmm. to have them communicate to you. And then your questions evolve. So, so... You know, we, we, I mean, we all been locked up over the last year, but, but, you know, we tend to think that something new applies with the research methods, but I think the same old research methods and then try to hone our questions, right? So, so what, in which field are you interested in data protection, for example? So, so what I've seen in my work on this wearables for good competition, which is why maybe it's a good thing to look back. UNICEF had a completely uncritical idea about children's digital bodies in 2015. But this year, you know, they've come out with lots of digital standards for kids. I mean, it, it's seen as much more problematic that you have this data hoarding for edtech. So things happen as well, right, in terms of who has rights and who needs protection. So I, I think as, as sort of students and scholars, what we do is we try to hone in on specific questions so we can formulate critiques. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's a comment in the chat, but it's it's not really a question. It, it says that technology by Isabel von Eschkadia, technology is not neutral at all. Hands-on activities are a good way for refugees and students to understand and experience it. Um, and as um, actually, I don't see another question right now. I actually um, um, would like to take my uh, this opportunity uh, to ask maybe one question to each uh, of you for the start. And um, for Dev, I would like to ask you um, about the so-called boomerang effect uh, that like sco critical scholars like Mark Duffield, um, uh, for instance, pointed to. So this idea that, I mean, governing technologies and it's something that Christian also mentioned, are tested uh, in humanitarian crisis settings um, or countries with lower levels of, of um, human rights and data protection in the global south before they then kind of are re-imported or imported uh, for as governing tool also in the global north. And um, because actually you are like an IR scholar and um, also like um, yeah, do research on, on other um, fields of global policy, my question is, um, how how do you see that this rise of digital humanitarianism does it how does it relate to kind of broader trends of um, in global governance? Uh, yeah, thanks. Shall I answer directly? Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. think cool. would, if that's sure. okay for you. Oh, sure, no you... problem. Yeah. Uh, yes, I mean, I think that's. I would say that's maybe two questions. Um, yeah, so on the boomerang effect and sort of the broader sort of embeddedness of, of these trends and, and sort of broader trends of global governance, I would say um, yes and yes. <laughs> um, so um, 
yeah, do, do we see this boomerang effect? I would say, I mean, historically speaking, def definitely. I mean, uh, there are several authors. I mean, Christine has worked on this. I mean, Katja lindskov jakobsen and, and um, many others um, who have shown that sort of historically, um, so sort of the humanitarian space has always been a test bed for new forms of of governing of of uh, controlling even sort of the the technology of of refugee camp um, themselves as a technology of uh, sort of colonial warfare or um, sort of made possible through um, technologies such as the barbed wire um, um, are an example in in this respect. Um, and and we can yeah see many other examples where um, forms of so social control have been tested in sort of the periphery um, in in uh, colonial spaces um, firsthand and then sort of yeah brought back to to um, to industrialized uh, states or so um, and the other question on sort of the embeddedness in in broader um yeah developments in global governance yeah to to me i mean you mentioned this this um sort of project of mine on, on the knowledge politics of security in the anthropocene so where we are looking um in changes of sort of knowledge production and governance with regard to environmental risks which has a sort of close linkage to to the humanitarian field as well and to disaster risk reduction and so on we uh, can see basically the exact um sort of sort of trend and and to me i think there is uh, as the way i would understand the anthropocene is sort of as as a kind of yeah multiple crisis um in the sense that it it's not only about sort of a changing environment and all the uh, sort of disasters and and threats that are coming with it it's also about it's also a crisis of um, knowledge production in, in this and and governance uh, sort of in the sense that the established forms of uh, governing these risks um yeah are failing and in relation to technological change uh, we can see um, yeah, emerging forms of uh, new forms of, of, of governing such risks, um, drawing on technologies such as AI, big data, and um, yeah, all the technologies that we've been discussing so far today. So uh, yeah, very good questions, and I, uh, I would basically agree with with these observations. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Dave. And maybe I can mention that, um, like in face of this, um, yeah crisis of the Anthropocene and maybe the challenges related on how can we like um, yeah, gain knowledge about it and uh, learn about it. I would like to mention that um, Dave together with uh, two other um, colleagues just uh, published a book on teaching international relations in the Anthropocene. Um, so um, for not only the students but also other lecturers um, I can <laughs> really recommend that. And, and then I have maybe also um, Question to Christine, and thank, thank you, Christine, for um, the um, references in, in the chat. Um, and my question would be um, because um, Dev, in his example, mentioned also that like, this um, forms of resistance by refugees, um, and there were also was also this question about could maybe even technology be used um, as for practices of resistance. And like now, when we look at this general trend towards digitalization, um, is this kind of going? Will this just kind of intensify and unfettered, like in the humanitarian sector, or do you uh, maybe, um, on the one hand, from beneficiaries, but also from humanitarian actors, are there any practices of resistance, or is this just kind of okay? This is like the the movement we have. Just try to catch up with it. Well, you know, generally most people who are finding themselves in a humanitarian emergency, you know, they're not exactly rescued by the UN. You know, they rescue themselves and their own neighbors, right? So, so we, we shouldn't overestimate the power of humanitarian organizations. You know, it, it's not, you know, it's it's not like this is not sort of a Stasi. Uh, they're not overpowering. Um, and 
so I think to the extent to which we do critical research, we, we need to sort of carve out the area of governance and, and power that we actually assume they have. Um, in terms of resistance, I think there are, you know, they're, they're really disconcerting things, right? So, so the Trump government has started taking DNA tests at the Mexican border. Uh, I think we are, you know, very few steps away from DNA tests being deployed across the humanitarian field. There is a currently an extremely dodgy initiative out there where Kings, together with an Australian uh, humanitarian worker of sorts, wants to take DNA of children born in, in sort of emergency development zones and upload them to you know, US uh, heritage, my heritage, one to three me, so they can, you know, find fathers and, and sort of punish humanitarian pedophiles or whatever, right? It's part of the safeguarding movement. But this is essentially commodifying these children as evidence and, you know, uploading their, their data to forever and ever and older children's children to American databases. So this is extremely extractive. And, and then you have the security aspect of, of you know, of being able to sort of quote unquote find terrorists. So how easy it is to resist against this, I don't know. I mean, the, these practices are practices that we're all subjected to, right? With biometrics and, and with vaccine passports and everything. Um, I, I think, I mean, the extent to which we see sort of very much physical resistance now in refugee setting is, you know, you have, demonstrations against not being screened for resettlement. You have anecdotal evidence, for example, of uh, a Bur Burundian congregation refusing to do biometric registration with Rwandese authorities and returning home. Um, I think we don't really know enough about this, right? And, and then I also think that in terms of digital politics, you know, to pardon my language, but we're all kind of screwed. Um, but, but I think it's important not to fetishize the power of humanitarian organizations. And they have a limited presence in, in most people's lives. Big tech, on the other hand, doesn't. Hmm. Yeah, thank you for this. And there's a, another question in the chat um, that I read out because it's anonymous. We cannot even protect the West from the problematic elements of technology as such. Is it even feasible or even possible to project places and times of humanitarian crisis. I think that goes probably in the similar direction of what you just said. If I can just add, I, I we just published an article on sort of technologizing sexual violence with the ICRC. I can put it in the chat. Um, but it's super interesting to see that if you have very good data on, on rapes in a certain geographical areas, that data has a different interest and a different use for a humanitarian actor who wants perhaps to protect and provide medical treatment for a human rights actor who wants justice and for international criminal justice. You know, 10 years down the road, they want a court case and they would like a witness. So, so data circulates in, in new and difficult ways and, and sort of the intentions and the objectives of, of all these actors that are all you know, good actors out to protect people sometimes have to stand in tension. And, and I think we need to be alert to those tensions more. Um, and you know, you can create real new problems for people. And then the question is for how long should you be able to save the data and save all this information and, and you know, what can be done with it? Um, yeah, uh, but, 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 but I think at the moment, you know, it's like we're grasping in the dark, all of us trying to figure out what's going on. Um, and of course, this is always what it's like. Okay, thank you. So as uh, there, I don't see any more questions and we also like a uh, perfect uh, time as was envisaged. But I mean, still, I think for me, um, what I get out is that really we have to like, yeah, take on this, this subject and we're just at, uh, I mean, we, we are maybe, we're uh, complaining about the lack of um, humanitarian practitioners in maybe in, in digital literacy, uh, but also what I, what I realized even more is that, I mean, it's also like uh, a huge 
gap or, or we are far behind these developments and have to really kind of there's so much um, happening that uh, that we should kind of also like be attentive uh, to and follow and um, I also have to say myself that I, I also need more digital literacy probably to um, follow up on this and what your last uh, exam also of the um, the this following tracking of or the use of data for searching fathers um, means I mean that's also again a perfect example of this um, double um, function of care and control that Dave Oates also highlighted and also in other articles by Katalin Kofiakopsen. I mean I think that's something that has always been characteristic probably of humanitarianism and yeah? this uh, kind of double uh, this is a function of humanitarian government yeah? care and control but that it's kind of seems to kind of intensify even further in both regards with these kind of new governmental uh, technologies yeah? it's making care more efficient more effective but at the same time intensifies surveillance and control. Yeah, so yeah, I found this, um, yeah, really fascinating and uh, really I'm much more motivated even more to, to follow this, um, these developments. So I thank um, Christine and Delv for these really insightful inputs and for the time. I thank um, Maximilian for the technical side. And I thank, of course, also uh, the audience uh, for their attention, for the questions. And now I wish all of you a nice afternoon and a nice uh, weekend, I think I can say. <laughs> so goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.